Good morning, good morning, and welcome. I hope everybody has slept well and had a good journey for those of us who are just joining us. This is day two, Sunday, of the 2014 Company of Ideas Forum on Art as a Source of Knowledge. Today we welcome two new members to this year's Company of Ideas. Uh, Elizabeth Wallace, who uh, did her undergrad in uh, physics and, and her postgrad in Edinburgh. She then did a year of uh, uh, postdoc in Princeton, followed by teacher training, uh, teaching uh, physics and being involved in academic policy in England and Scotland. Um, after uh, meeting the love of her life, she uh, <laughs> became a, a, a large part of the Churchill College community, uh, two notable uh, occupations being firstly the Hanging Committee, which is a wonderful name for the a group of people who determine what will be shown uh, in the Churchill College, I'm assuming, uh, gallery. Uh, and the second wonderful committee is the Wine Committee, which chooses the wine uh, for the college, which I, I hear she's quite an expert at choosing the young wines, which will then mature. Uh, uh, followed, of course, uh, by uh, her esteemed husband, uh, David Wallace. Uh, following an undergraduate and postgraduate study in theoretical physics at the University of Edinburgh, David Wallace continued research at Princeton University as a Harkness Fellow. In 1972, he was appointed as a lecturer in the physics department at the University of Southampton. In 1979, he returned to the University of Edinburgh as a Tate Professor of Mathematical Physics. He was also the director of the Edinburgh uh, Parallel Computing Center. Uh, the vice chancellor of the <laughs> right, the vice chancellor of the Lockbrook University uh, for 12 years from 1994. Uh, he moved to Cambridge in 2006 um, as master of Churchill College and uh, in 2011 as the N. M. Rothschild and Sons Professor of Mathematical Sciences and director of the Isaac Newton Institute. He is former president of the Institute of Physics and treasurer and vice president of the Royal Society. He has served as a member of the Engineering and Physical Sciences Research Council and uh, was awarded the CBE for services to parallel computing in, 1960, in 1996 and knighted in 2004 for services to UK science, technology, and engineering. So please welcome David and Elizabeth Wallace. Jeffrey, just before you sit down, can I, can I say? Please. Um, uh, thank you very much for inviting us here. Look, really looking forward to this. Um, uh, if I have any qualification, it is that when I was at Loughborough, I interacted with a social scientist there, and I gave a talk whose title was unbelievably pretentious. It was towards a probably approximately correct theory of knowledge. <laughs> <laughs> they thought it was awful, but it, I endeared myself to them by the fact that I had tried. <laughs> so anyway, looking forward to the occasion. Thank you very Wonderful. much. So uh, yesterday I got some feedback that we wanted a bit more time for discussion. It, I, we had to cut it short and get some heating blankets. So today I'd like to start on time and hopefully we can uh, exhaust all the questions and comments. And I'll just uh, turn it over to James to lead us away. Thank you, Karun. Um, and it is, it is lovely to see David and Elizabeth here. My first job as an academic was at Churchill College. And I remember on my first day going to the Master's Lodge for drinks and being utterly intimidated, um, and even more intimidated now I've heard the CV again. Um, anyway, um, so uh, I just want to begin by saying thank you to Betty and Jeffrey for, for last night. It was such a, such a lovely evening uh, out in Seabreeze, and those are the kind of evenings you, know, you remember forever, for years and years and years. So thank you so much. It was great. And I'm also pleased to report that there are no bonfire-related fatalities. <laughs> from last night. Um, so, um, so yes, I thought, I mean, I thought uh, that yesterday morning was a, was a new e experiment for us to try and have a more um, you know, equal conversation. I think it worked really well and everyone um, contributed really fascinating um, points. So I hope we can continue where we, where we left off. We're doing three um, slightly broader questions uh, today, but I hope that we can, you know, I don't feel we should, now we're in the day two, we don't need to be too hemmed in, and if people want to take these, these points in slightly different directions and expand them, that would be wonderful. And um, at the end of the questions, if anyone feels there are issues that we haven't 
discussed in detail and they want to raise them, um, we should do that as well. So, but let's begin um, with the, the, the first question uh, that is posed, and that is, um, I mean, very briefly, is, is Jeffrey Rubinoff a, a Cold War artist? Um, that many of you probably have read um, one of Jeffrey's pieces about being born in the shadow of the end game. He was born in 1945 at a crucial early moment in the Cold War. Your favorite film, I think, is Dr. Strangelove. Um, you have a fascination um, with the, the military industrial complex. You talk about it a lot. And um, you have taken up residence in a region that is filled with, with draft dodgers. And you know, this community is, in, in British Columbia seems you know, very much, a, in, in some ways, a product of what was happening politically at the time. So is, are we right, therefore, to, to call Jeffrey Rubinoff a Cold War artist um, or, or a political artist? Um, if so, what are his perspectives on the Cold War? And how do those views differ from, uh, from other artists of his generation? Um, and I suppose the broader question is, why has the Cold War had this huge impact on a huge cultural footprint, if you like, over the years? Um, so those are the, the questions we can tease out today. Um, we're very lucky, obviously, to have um, uh, an, an expert on these matters in Francis Stoner Saunders, looking terrified, um, <laughs> sitting in the corner. Um, but Geoffrey, would you like, is there anything you want to, to, to say um, at the outset here before we get going on our discussion? Well, I don't know that I would determine that I'm a Cold War artist, but what I have said uh, as I see the role of the artist is uh, witness to existence itself. And so issues that rise to uh, the ability to challenge ex existence itself uh, is the business of the artist the way that I see it. because. If the artist is witness, then he also has to be witness to those things that actually threaten it. So given the possibilities of the Cold War and the way that I've lined out, even as uh, we theoretically have left it, uh, I've pointed out in the last paper the amount of armaments that still exist that can in fact precipitate something close to a nuclear winter, if not a nuclear winter itself. And so there's a history of how we've arrived here. And, um, and so that's one aspect of it. And I've also pointed out in the last paper that we're on the verge of another threat to our total existence, and that's transgenic engineering, unless, of course, we bring it under some form of understanding so that it's not runaway the way that um, GMOs went. So, Am I a Cold War artist? I would think that other people are going to have to determine that. Am I concerned with very core questions of existence itself? Yes, that's the role of the artist from my point of view. So that's, uh, 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 we would like to pretend that the Cold War was resolved in some way or another. And instead of being resolved, it's simply been put on a back burner and it's so evidently there, and so evidently there uh, in the events unfolding in different parts of the world, including the Ukraine right now. So that's what I have to say to introduce it. That should do it, from my point, for now. <laughs> Can I just ask um, one question to you before we, we, we open this up to the field? Do you, um, do you feel that what you're doing here, and what, in your art rather than your ideas, is in any way political? Mm. No, I can't see it as political. I see it as, um, as, as looking for the legacy of humanity, and if that's political, which I think many people would interpret that way, it's something that seems to overreach politics itself, which is divisive, and it seems to me that the legacy of humanity is something that I would like to see as a generally agreed statement as opposed to the divisions of politics automatically engender. Uh, Francis and then uh, Peter. I, uh, James, uh, you, you rightly said um, I looked a bit nervous. I do, but that's really on account of um, that late night by the bonfire and all that, <laughs> all that alcohol. I mean, uh, what do you call it? Mar marshmallows, yeah. <laughs> 
Um, but I, I, thinking about the Cold War in, in the context of where we are is, is sort of... Um, I mean, I know Comox is around the corner because I've been told, but, but with my own eyes, I see a place that seems to be um, almost, almost disconcertingly remote from the concerns of the world. I'm, I'm loving being here, but I'm sort of undone by it at the same time because I don't quite know how mm. to respond to the fact that, that the walls that I'm used to encountering in a, in a social and political context don't seem to be here. And I know that's an illusion, but it's a happy one to be living for a brief while. And I, the, the thing that I ask myself most in, in, in relationship to you and the work you've done here is, um, you know, for the, for, the, for the artist working in the Cold War, during the Cold War, which I, I think arguably is still very much uh, actually prevalent, and I think mm. the Ukraine that you've just mentioned um, shows us that the basic uh, binaries and, uh, and uh, antinomies of the Cold War are still very operative. The, the rhetoric certainly is, is comes straight from the 40s and 50s. Uh, them and us, right and wrong. It's not very nuanced. But the question that was asked of artists during the Cold War was were they going to paint about the Cold War, and so, or could their work be interpreted in some way as, 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 as reflecting concerns or addressing concerns about the Cold War, or did it, did it just happen to be painting in the Cold War? And what happened to many artists was that they, they came under enormous pressure, or their work did, even if they didn't, from the temptation, which was rarely resisted by the various sides, to, to launder it for ideological purposes. Now, my question to you would be, um, your, what has your experience been as somebody who hasn't had to make um, awkward decisions with regard to, to that relationship to, to institutions and government and, and the art market because you've effectively withdrawn from it? Um, what are you making your artistic decisions in relation to, if not to some kind of that kind of context. You live through it, but you're not actually relating to it, or are you escaping it? Or I, so I just want, I want to sort of press you a little bit on this idea of what it is to be an artist during the Cold War when you have the, the ability and the privilege, if you like, to withdraw almost totally from, from the conditions of it. Um, my definition of art is uh, an act of will in accord with a mature conscience. And when I, it came about, it was when I was mm, probably after the first series or during the first series. And really what it was about was how does an artist measure his own work? And it's based on the artist knows. In other words, his conscience is based on uh, what he knows about his own work, whether he's completed it or not, any of those things. No one else often can judge whether or not what the artist has done. But it was based on, uh, I wanted that definition to be based, so it was really internal to art, the way that I saw it. But I wanted it based on something that happened to me, something that I read when I was 19 that had a, a profound effect on me. And it was a, uh, an article, and I believe it's in the New York Times, I haven't been able to find it, but it was essentially an extrapolation of the uh, uh, the Ethics of Ambiguity by Simone de Beauvoir. And she was dealing with the question of the trains leaving Paris and going to Auschwitz. And she used them because the example is, is that the infrastructure goes all the way down to the most common man uh, being in collusion with the machinery of murder. And so her, this article is very, very clear. These people went to church every Sunday, they had a morality. They had a morality that they were certain of, a group's moral certainty, and yet at the same time, they could mechanically get up every day, keep those trains running, keep them oiled, keep them steamed, keep them fueled, and they knew what they were doing exactly. Her point was this, was that to resist became a, a, uh, an obligation of conscience, and this is really important because what it does is it does what the Cold War does itself and what she did in this. And that was separate morality from conscience. And this is a very, very important thing. Uh, Heidegger's view of conscience 
was that it simply tells you what you can't do, and therefore, in a sense, you have to violate that. And of course, that makes the perfect Nazi, which he became. So she had a very different point of view that I thought was most important to me and, and, and was uh, a revelation to me at the age of 19, and, and it was one of those things that I've carried with me ever since. She said that existence itself is based on acts of individual conscience, and that's very different than individual acts of conscience, because that would just simply isolate conscience as a fragmented thing. So she placed the value, and you can see that this was an extrapolation from the ethics of ambiguity, because the ethics of ambiguity is about choice. So she places the responsibility on the individual and views that as existence itself. So uh, when I extrapolated that into art, art is an act of will in accord with a mature conscience, it also spread out in terms of my thinking, in terms of what the artist's role is in the world. And the artist's role in the world that I see is this witness to existence. And therefore, since the artist, if the artist can adapt that idea or adopt that idea of an act of will in accord with a mature conscience internally for his own work, then he also has to adopt it and adapt it for the consciousness of the, of the world itself. So much of the insights that grew out of the work, and, and they're part of the website, and part of what we've done with this, uh, 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 these forums, which we call the Company of Ideas, were based on how do you cope with the potential for a nuclear winter? How do you cope with these things which are past any of the history of civilization, and that's there. And so it's been a very, very set of interesting conversations in the form of how people will associate morality with conscience and how I have separated them out so clearly and have done so since I was 19. This is really important because when you look at, when in reading your book, what they're looking at is, is the question of their morality, not the question of their conscience. And what interests me is the question of, of individual conscience. This is like, uh, since, if, if, uh, since I agreed with this article and I agreed so strongly and it so profoundly affected me for my life as to this idea that you're bound to your, your existence itself is bound to your acts, uh, your, your acts of individual uh, conscience, then, it takes the concept of existence itself as the centerpiece of, of the issues that are here and the centerpiece of the issues of, of art itself. And I really do believe that the, those artists who, who were most like Rothko, any, any of the artists who were really, really aware of this, were really talking about the same thing as I'm talking about, the aspect of existence itself and how their art was a manifestation was a manifestation of the witness of existence itself. And so if you look at it, that's a very profound statement of what art actually is. So that needs to go beyond the essence of the Cold War. And, and the aspect of the Cold War where, where most of this work in your, your book is, is up to about 1955. But I've taken it from 1959 from uh, Herman Kahn on thermonuclear warfare. That book was a bestseller throughout the pol political world, it was on all sides. And there we really see the split between, we really see the split between morality and conscience. And this is the part that's most difficult for most people to, to go. They, they interchange the terms and then they can't separate the two out as they operate. And the best example, which I had hoped, you know, it, which I hoped to touch on in the last paper I did, was what happens uh, with, uh, with the, con the real concept of deterrence is, is how do you bring this to a standstill? Therefore, you have a conscious, self-conscious statement of how do you decide on megadeth? How are you going to trade megadeth? It becomes transactional. And that is the policy. I'm convinced that, uh, you know, uh, all of the policy of deterrence from that point on is, retains Herman Kahn's concept 
of how do you bring it to a standstill, not mutually assured destruction, which is so easy for everyone to hate as an idea. But that's not the way G. Turns actually operates uh, politically now. It, it, it operates on the basis of how do you bring it to a standstill in case it accidentally starts? Because after all, if it accidentally starts, then you're certainly going to go to total destruction. Francis, do you... I'm, 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 the thing that's, that I find fascinating about this is that you are, you know, you are clearly very engaged with, with you know, the problems, the ambiguities, the, the, the moral mm -hmm. issue, issues of conscience and of consciousness. And yet you are, um, it seems to me, you have deliberately withdrawn from a, a, a situation of, of, what, of, of direct contact of... Uh, your, your message is a humanistic one, and your work is about humanity, I think. It's part of what we were talking about yesterday. And yet it's done with very little contact with other humans. I'm excluding this situation, but I see... Maybe I've got this wrong, but I see you almost like, you know, a stylite in the desert who's been sitting on his pillar for 30 years in, in, in intense contemplation and thought. So... The difficulty for the artist, is, and you mentioned de, de Beauvoir, of course, is, is how, how can you com be committed, as you clearly are, and engaged, but also part of a social contract in which that engagement can, can help to um, move questions of morality and conscience on, or around at least, as, as I, I'm assuming that we all pretty much go round and round the same things, including ourselves, rather than, I don't believe in a linear progressive mm -hmm. line, and I don't think the abstract expressionists did either. So mm -hmm. I suppose that's what, you're in, a, you're in a very unique situation, and I haven't met another artist mm -hmm. who is in this situation. So I'm very interested in, in, in knowing from you what it's, what it, I mean, have you had to sort of resist the impulse just to rush off to New York or Vancouver or wherever it might be and say, listen, I need to be heard. These are the things I, as an artist, I have to say, or have you been happy to just be having this conversation internally? Okay, it began uh, for me, I would have thought the other way coming into it, that history influenced art. It was totally influenced art. Uh, and the ideas of history totally influenced art. And that was the way I began. And then with piece three, I made my transition into the value of art history itself, because that was the challenge here, was whether or not art history, or history, doesn't matter, can be the starting point of a great creative run. Now what happened was, is that the ideas started to flow from the work, not the other way around. And so when the, the work I looked at in a, in a very Hegelian way as an argument for history, they, that those were my arguments. Each one was an argument for the progression of history, so the progress had to be there, and the evolution of history. But what happened, and it was a total surprise to me, when the insights started to flow the other way, they followed the work. Therefore, doing the work first was most important in order to mine the ideas, in a sense, you know, like bring them to the forefront. Now, I call them insights because my commitment and my argument to history are the pieces themselves. The insights seem to have been some strange gift that came back from the work that was totally unexpected. So one of the, uh, over the course uh, uh, of the pieces evolving, one of the most obvious questions to me was, well, when was the advent of modernism itself? And that made me think historically, and I started moving in history. I, I suppose every true historian somehow or another finds themselves traveling through history, you know? And when you write your book, you're traveling through history. So I, I had that not only the ability to make art, but the strange feeling of being able to travel through history. The, I decided that the advent, of, uh, the advent of modernism, so this was again from the work as we were moving, the advent of modernism was the globalization of warfare, so therefore strategic bombing, where uh, at, at first it was to stop the other side from manufacturing, uh, ball bearings and other things to, to stop uh, what they called strategic materials from being produced. By the end of the war, it meant destroying other cities. Because after all, the best way to flatten the issue of, of industrialization in, in, in a given city was just to flatten it. And so by the end of the war, it meant strategic bombing, now meant flattening it. It's that globalization of war 
which changed all of our sensibility with it and with nuclear weapons and the ability to deliver them anywhere in the world at any time, we were in a different place. So I needed an intellectual structure on how to deal with such a thing. Jeffrey, yes. could I interrupt your flow yeah. at that point? Because it seems to me um, the way that this discussion has developed has illustrated the continuum of, of ideas mm. with which we should be concerned in the course of this morning. We will, of course, later in the mm -hmm. morning be c sure. considering the question of your ideas in general here. But in, in this session, as... Okay, as can we, we put we, the dialogue back then? Back can to we put it on hold and, the, and we'll, yes, we'll cover yes, it as we move uh, through? Because sure. I, th I think we, we are perhaps mm -hmm. in, in danger of losing our focus on yeah. the Cold War itself and yeah. what we mean by that. Can I therefore um, lower the tone a bit in the way that empirical historians like me are often prone to do? And we'll, we'll come down to a slightly less uh, theoretical level here. It seems to me that we've got to distinguish more sharply than we've done so this morning so far between two things. One is the Cold War and the other is the nuclear age and the whole problems of nuclear deterrence. We've been speaking hitherto very largely as though those are two synonym synonyms mm. for the same thing. But they're not. When Jeffrey says, it's all here, isn't it, in his... Um, mm. uh, uh, um, contribution to the 2012 um, symposium. I was born in the shadow of the end game. You know, he was born in 1945. Um, this was the year, obviously, in which the actual explosion of nuclear weapons over Japan brought to an end the, the Second World War. So we enter the nuclear age, but we don't actually then suddenly enter the Cold War. Where does the Cold War come in? To this, the, the the earliest real marker we have for the the Cold War, well, one of them, perhaps it's one of which I'm particularly aware as a student of of, of, of Winston Churchill, is Churchill's uh, speech at, at Fulton, Missouri, in 1946, where he says, "From in the Baltic to Trieste and the Adriatic, an iron curtain is descending uh, upon Europe," and the idea of a Cold War. Uh, between two ideologically defined blocks in the world then becomes a dominating issue. But it's not actually them which depends on nuclear deterrence uh, uh, in a false sense because only one side has the nuclear weapons at least for a few years until the Soviet Union uh, acquires them uh, um, and has the, the edge bomb mm -hmm. by, the, by the early 50s. So it's only by the 50s that we then move into what we think of a classic uh, Cold War period where we have a, a divided world, an ideological conflict on, on, on the one side, ideological and territorial, of course, um, overlaid by a nuclear standoff uh, between two fully armed uh, superpowers or alliances. Um, and it's worth bearing that in mind. It seems to me that Jeffrey's consciousness of the Cold War is essentially a product of the late 50s and, and 60s, where we have that sort of dimension, where we are in an either-or situation uh, that you have to choose which side you're on here. It's, it's a choice which is an ideological choice. It may be underpinned in, in the world outside there by, uh, by a nuclear uh, balance and by the uh, de deterrent uh, effect uh, or otherwise, as, as Jeffrey would in the end argue between them. But it seems to me that that's, that's a distinction we, we should bear in mind in focusing them particularly back to the issue of how far Jeffrey Rubinoff's work is a product of the Cold War. If, it, if it's a product of the Cold yes. War, I would suggest it, it was of that classic era of the 50s and 60s. Can we, can we go to Francis who wants to come back on that and then Karun wants to speak? Yeah, I would just, um, um, I would uh, um, question a little bit the, the idea of the sort of divisibility, if you like, between, between the two. I mean, it seems to me that the, 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 the entire dialogue and 
and uh, the tension between you know different discourses and and conversations during the Cold War um, was was determined to an extraordinarily intimate and uncomfortable degree by the presence of the nuclear uh, of the bomb. And I mean, if we want to look at abstract expressionists, I'm not I'm not going to propose a psychoanalytic sort of interpretation of Pollock's work, but there's a lot to be said for the idea that that these these knotted frantic lines that are right out the edge of and beyond the canvas could in some way be a response to to uh, you know the the dropping of the bomb i mean i do i think that i think they're much more directly connected and i think it's possible to be having um uh, thoughts and and ideas about the cold war uh, that are absolutely um entangled with a fear of or anxiety about the 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 nuclear threat. I, I, I don't see them in any, I understand in terms of, you know, historic, I would also say that, you know, if we want to talk about ideas about the Cold War and the artist, you know, the dress rehearsal is in the 30s. It's way before we've ever heard of nuclear weapons. So in the cultural context, these, these things have been developing for a long time, but this marks such a sort of, um, it's, a, it's a seminal moment. It's a, it, what can you do with art after Hiroshima? What can you do once you've dropped the bomb? Where, where can art go? What can it tell you? What can it offer humanity? Do you retreat to the ivory tower and go back to the model of the artist of sort of indulging in, in uh, soft self-probings? Or do you get out there and say, you know, no, I want to do something that makes this sort of... End. And that's what I find interesting about the sort of dynamic of Jeffrey's thought and what's going on here. You, can you do both at the same time? Can you withdraw? and still be making a, a, a moral and conscientious statement about humanity. That's, that's the thing that's curious to me, and it seems to me that this place asks this question very directly. Karun, would you like to speak? Yeah. I had a conversation with you in, I think, 2010. It was a conversation with Jeffrey, and it, was, it might, might have been 2011. I think it was 2010. In which I asked the question of efficacy. So don't, the question sort of went like this. It was more of a, you know, hypothetical. Don't you have to, don't you have to give a little and rationalize a little and uh, compromise in order to be effective? That was, let's just sum it up. And I think what you said to me is, if you live, if you act in accord with your conscience, that's the first thing you get right. If you don't get that right, you don't get anything else right. And so I always thought that, that was quite a, purest response to that, that question because I was saying, well, you know, um, in, in real life you have to you make compromises and, and to, to move your agenda forward and all these things that um, you know, I've been involved with uh, over many years. And I thought it was really interesting for me to have that conversation with you and I just wondered if um, how that played into your decision to do the work in the way that you have done it, which is you know, far removed from political statements, far removed from any kind of direct activism, which so many artists really do do. I mean, that is, and I, uh, I mean, I could, I could say that you know, there, there must be artists that worked within the time period of the Cold War that their art directly addressed when reflected the culture and reflected the politics as a way of commenting on it or as a way of just protesting or being disgusted by it or as a way of them having a therapeutic release or, you know, psychologically working through it. I found your work to be interesting because it was saying, this is all there, but I'm, tr you know, what's, what is something that is still worthwhile? And I always felt that what, what I always felt that what you wanted to accomplish was some hopeful place and not some despairing place. And so there was, you know, it was, how do you, how do you regain something that's, that is hopeful and, and that where, where the, you can witness the value as opposed to dwell in the disintegration or the potential negatives. So that's, that was just an experience that I really valued about you know, three, four years ago. Karun, I'm going to ask that if, if we have as many voices as possible and then Jeffrey can respond to uh, lots of these things towards, towards the end of the discussion. But so I know Joan and others want to speak, so. Um, I just uh, wanted to respond to actually uh, to Francis. And the question was, can you with, how can you withdraw to a place like this, essentially, and still maintain a connection to reality? What is that reality, in a way? 
if it's not the reality we know that includes the walls that you alluded to at the very beginning. And um, that brought me to the connection that Jeffrey, that I believe Jeffrey feels to abstract expressionist artists, which is that those artists were trying to operate totally out, outside of those um, sort of polarities that had been defined as you know either social realism or things that linked you directly to current events, to go to um, cultures that were outside our own, that were pre-cultural, that were anthropological, any, looking for any other source of insight that would enable them to move forward by going back to something else. Very often that something else was an idealized world. Jeffrey seems to have found that idealized world here. So he got to actually live it, which was highly unusual, rather than just intellectualize it. So that's, the, that's a, an interesting sort of connection that I see, even though, as Peter points out, he's doing this in 1970 and 1980, which is, is the problem that I keep butting heads against. You know, the, the conundrum is it's happening after the fact, sort of. And it's, it keeps bringing me back in time to the 50s and 60s, but it's actually happening later. So that's why I keep asking you, Jeffrey, gee, this is 1970. What made you go here in 1970? But that's, that's the back and forth that I'm having. That was my response to your statement. I, I have a question for, for Peter and for, for David and Maria. Um, as someone who, I mean, I, I, was, you know, I was born when the Cold War was still going, but I didn't certainly have a career by then. Did you feel that the, and we talk about the influence of the, um, uh, of the Cold War on artists, but did you feel that the Cold War in any way affected your, or, or, or influenced your intellectual development? Um, not, uh, for me, not so much the Cold War, but um, your, your question was uh, quite opposite to the little notes that I've written here. So, um, the first thing I want to say uh, just as, is that my first real um, direct exposure to the Cold War was actually at Whitehorse in Canada. When I went there in the, um, this was in the uh, 80s, uh, because the sort of, I believe that the 24 hour nuclear bomber deterrence was flying out of Whitehorse and we heard them uh, taking off and landing in the middle of the night. That was really spooky and I hadn't had an experience like that before. Although, but I'm coming back to the uh, sort of more structured comment. Um, yeah, I was born in 1945 as well <laughs> and um, yeah, I was uh, deeply um, influenced um, by it, um, and we both um, brought up at the time. So here's the first, the first issue there for, do I separate Cold War and uh, nuclear deterrence? For, uh, for me, the real, the real thing was, uh, was the nuclear deterrence and, and the thought of the, of the nuclear bomb. I didn't think of it at that time as... Um, as, as a Cold War thing. I'm not sure if that's a helpful comment. What might be a helpful comment is that, for me, theoretical physics was my escapism. Yeah? And I did that actually to get away from, in part, from, a, from the reality of the world. And it's actually rather ironic because the area that I worked in, and my PhD supervisor was, was Peter Higgs of Higgs Particles, so I was in sub-nuclear physics, I was in the child of the nuclear mm -hmm. physics which was responsible for the bomb, and I thought I was escaping. <laughs> I was escaping. <laughs> yeah. so, um, so does this, um, uh, does this lead to any insight? Well, the one sort of germ in my head at this point, which I, clearly I, I don't understand anything yet, um, mm -hmm. but the one germ is that um, you have um, developed these ideas of um, you know, the, the individual uh, conscience and so forth, um, but my guess would be that um, the issues of, of, let's say, the nuclear deterrence and, and mutually assured destruction was actually one of the shapers of the more general uh, ideas that you have had and the way that and transgenic engineering has become another example uh, of the shaper of your idea. So um, that, that's the, the little picture that I have uh, emerged at uh, personally from a very different direction. <laughs> <laughs> Would it, does anyone else have, have a, a point to make on that? Yes, Maria. Well, <clears throat> in the 1960s, <clears throat> excuse me, I lived in Berlin for three years, 
um, and certainly was aware of the Cold War. Spent my weekends in the East, most of my friends were in the East. Um, and that prompted me to do my first degree in Russian art. And then I worked in Moscow in the late 60s and early 70s in two, two art collections. Um, so it, 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 it sort of influenced me. It influenced me the way I work in many ways outside of the, um, the art history tradition, being a cultural historian. And uh, uh, certainly the Cold War influenced me um, during those early years. Peter? I, I would just briefly say, um, r relating uh, again to something that, that Jeffrey says, um, you, 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 you said, I got the Cuban Missile Crisis for my 17th um, birthday present. <laughs> I th um, I'm three years older than um, uh, Jeffrey, so it wasn't my 17th birthday present, but I think mm -hmm. anybody who lived through the Cub Cuban Missile Crisis in 1962 will have an abiding memory of that week or, or 10 days, uh, which was the moment where we were closest to falling off the nuclear uh, precipice. And, I think uh, the sense of that being a, a searing event defining a, a generation at, at least is, I would have thought, inescapable. Karim? I mean, I didn't, I wasn't around in, 19, in the 1960s, uh, but I, I felt very acutely aware, um, and it was mainly, mainly through culture, I mean, mainly through uh, entertainment and the culture that we just absorbed in, in the 80s and 90s. Um, and I, I don't know that how that necessarily influenced me, but I would say that a lot of artists would take current events and, and political events as the subject matter of their work. And so to, to, you know, to call them Cold War artists or, or you know, anti-war artists or peace artists or environmental artists, I mean, people do that as some Part of their career, but I don't know what what utility that label would have necessarily uh, in general. I'm not an art historian. Maybe it does. Maybe it helps. Um, but I think that I wouldn't view Jeffrey's work as being um, the product of the uh, the time period. But I would certainly I think that it responds to uh, a more general desire to come to terms with it. Um, I think that. I wouldn't reduce it to just a mere you know, statement of rage against this reality, but I would. I think that there's something generative, that there's a an, an idea that the energy comes from there, but the energy can't stay there. It can't be bottled in that uh, that space of fear. And I don't. I don't have a sense of fear. I don't have a sense of the Cuban Missile Crisis when I walk through the sculpture park. I have a sense of hope. I do have a sense that there's, there's foreboding elements, there's strange elements, there are interesting juxtapositions, but I don't get a sense of hopelessness and fear, which would be, you know, yeah. Yeah, I, I would have added, I'm, I think, but this is true and I don't have it at the moment, and I think we have just become inured somehow. You know, we've, it, it's um, uh, impacting on us all the time and we've ceased to be um, sensitive um, to it, generally. Yeah, even those of us, well, most of us, not clearly not uh, Jeffrey, but um, you know, those of us, many, most of us brought up in those days that somehow now feel comfortable, it hasn't happened, we've stopped thinking about it, actually, most of us. Um, I mean, Je Jeffrey, do you want people to see this park as, a, as, a, as an optimistic place, as a place about hope and... and, and, and it, it's uh, about the assertion of existence, so... Uh, it's meant to be very positive in that um, if there isn't an alternative, then the bleakness is just simply around every corner. So, yes, uh, but we'll talk about this when, when Peter, obviously, he, he would like to do it then uh, on this concept that my engagement comes from the work itself, which is a reverse of the way that I looked at it before. So I can say, first the work had to come. And as the work matured and we began this park, and 
Karoo, I kept those ideas, I admit, essentially to myself, Karoon felt that they would be of value to his generation. And how that, how they, how this came about, how even the forums came about, was that we hadn't planned the building yet and it could have been anything. Karoon came in the November, the year before we put a shovel in the ground and visited the work, which he had never seen before. And he, he seemed to have been very in tune with the work and then, uh, on my tours, I talk about different ideas that came, but not very many, just enough to, to deal with it. So he said, well, will you sit down and talk about your ideas? And for two days, I just talked. And for two days, he transcribed. And then what he did is he, he translated it into a group of things that we call our insights. So they were like much smaller, not sound bites, but issues that would be the subject of conversation that we could use as a subject of conversation in having these forums. And so, if Karun hadn't valued them, they probably would have been just laid out that way because I didn't think this generation, although Liba had said to me before we started these forums, you know, my friends are starting to get interested in your ideas. So she was raised listening to this stuff going on. Now. <laughs> And then finally, you know, like seven or eight years ago, she said, you know, my friends are starting to get interested in this. So she's the one who like made me think that maybe these forums might be worthwhile, that these ideas which only Betty had really heard and, you know, ad nauseum over many, many years. <laughs> but, <laughs> but we're still together, so I have to say her patience, uh, his patience has been absolutely fantastic. But they would come with the work, and they would come after the work. And that's part of the problem here is, is that they don't Jeffrey, come before the work. I can't, I can't resist interjecting when you're mm -hmm. describing this relationship, mm -hmm. and especially bringing Lee mm -hmm. in. You remember what Mark Twain said, mm -hmm. how when he was 16, he thought his father was so stupid. Mm -hmm. But by the time he was 21, he, he was surprised how much the old man had learnt in the meantime. <laughs> <laughs> Did I answer that question? Yeah, very well. Yeah. Does anyone here on, on, from, who, who lives on the island have anything to say about, um, about you know, the political, political identity here? And I mean, I know that Vaughan, you, you, you came here, did you come here from the United States during Vietnam? And was it, what? As what? Peter told me, that's the best thing that never happened to me. <laughs> But are there a lot of are there a lot of people in this part of uh, part of Canada who who crossed the border as a result of Vietnam and the Cold War? The in designer general? of this building, Michael McNamara, yeah. is one, and his contribution is this building. So you know, and, and housing and employment all over this island. Yeah, I don't know. There was a lot of folks that <clears throat> came here. It was a kind of back to the land uh, sort of movement, I suppose. And it was great. It's fantastic. Yeah. So, but what what what's, what is the question? Well, no, you could say anything you like. Oh. <laughs> well. But did you feel that this was a, when you came up here that it was a kind of escape from political total realities? Escape. Total escape. Yeah. And and I find art making is sort of that way too. I can just get so immersed that everything else falls away. So that's the hook. Really, yeah. Was it kind of escape for, for you as well, Jeffrey? No, I, I always thought it was, it was quite different. As I, I saw it as my point of contact. Mm. Um, I was really aware. Well, when I came here, the Voodoo Squadron was here. They carried the Genie missile. They would take off in the middle of the night, just as you're describing, and they would match the bombers who were going to the fail-safe position. So they're all moving to the fail-safe position on both sides. To, to the moment of confrontation. They would come on both sides to the moment of confrontation, circle in their areas. The purpose of the Genie missiles were nuclear tip, but they were to shoot down Russian invaders. So that, that's what they were up there for. And in the middle of the night, you'd hear the roar, roar and they'd be taking off one after another and going to their fail-safe position every night. Yeah. So I, yeah, so I didn't, I was very conscious of that. 
uh, of the Voodoo Squadron. And uh, they, of course, they denied that there were any nuclear missiles on the base, but I had to, was a student pilot then and went for my the eye examination and all over the, the base where I was were the <laughs> nuclear warning signs. <laughs> It's okay, Jeffrey. No, I'm just mentioning that it's uh, 1040 or 1050. And if we want to get on to some of the other questions that I'm sure people have prepared. I, I just want one more yeah, yeah. comment on that. But they fly out of this base, but they were flying out of this base with not only the Voodoo's, but at that time, the Argus submarine chasers, which became the Orion submarine chasers, which they still fly out of here. Um, and so I have photographs of me photographing them, photographing me out among the sculpture, which is really very strange. They were circling and I was photographing them and they were photographing me, a very strange thing. And so uh, I was written up in, in, in uh, um, the, uh, the Air Canada magazine. And as soon as I was written up, I get a letter from the Belarus tractor company wanting me to have a Belarus tractor. I'm thinking, they're sending this thing full of electronic gear to be measuring what's to get, taking off and leaving from there. <laughs> it was immediate. <laughs> it's true. I think I've saved the letter somewhere, unless it got lost in the move. It was so hysterical. That's really I just wanted to I, I, I just wanted to bring the conversation just a bit back to Francis's original question, which is um, what's the point of contact between the subject matter and the art? You know, like where the contact is, and I was thinking just uh, on what you were saying um, and what you've said elsewhere that it's uh, sort of more obliquely through the material, through the choice of material, mm -hmm. which you've talked a lot about the relationship of your choice of steel to the um, industrial complex. And that I, I, I think that sort of that, that's sort of the hinge that maybe you find um, the connection that's not there in any illustrative way. Well, it's there in that one time when Krupp Steel came in and I was looking at it and wondering what the moral implications were. But yes, the content but also implications the, the were steel and you were but you're connect but you've talked so much about, you know, David Smith and steel and the military right, industrial yeah. con um, you know, and, and it's it's history and warfare and right. so I, I just in just trying to see where our thread if there is a thread of connection, I, I, I think that I'm thinking about it in terms of the material. Can I just add to Francis, that? I mean, there, yeah. is a, there is a danger that we start sort of truffling around, you know, mm. under trees here, hoping to find that one precious, you know, a piece of evidence that, you know, Jeffrey or indeed anyone else is a Cold War artist. Or, um, and I, I think what's really intriguing that's come up from what some of the things you've been saying today is that, and yesterday, is, is, is this idea. I don't know if it was Pound, Ezra Pound, was it Ezra Pound who said, you know, we artists are the antennae of our race? The idea that the art is a precursor to history, mm. it, it produces a history mm. rather than re reacts to or, or is a product of history. So uh, if, if there's something that might move us on to the, to the question of meaning, which I see is next on the agenda, mm. I wonder if it's somewhere in that, in that area. Mm. Can I ask a question of Francis? Do you see that, do you see there being um, artists or people, you know, people who practice art that you would consider artists that are not in front of, are not antenna in advance of uh, cultural or political reality, but they're perhaps more reflecting the current reality. I think Warhol was, 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 was in total response mode, and I think he was actually you know, kind of brilliant because he told us what we already knew, but in ways that were so inescapably Kind of, you know, vulgar and 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 obvious, but it did. It, it produces a whole set of insights. Of, you can produce insights on something you already know, but you just, you, yeah. So, but I, I don't know. I, I, I sort of envy artists, and I, and I pity them at the same time because I think what you have is no rules. You can make them up for yourselves. Yeah, you get to do stuff that you know, we're not allowed to do. On the other hand, you have to you have to live by the rules that you set for yourself in abandoning other sets of rules. So I think, you know, to spend 30 years working in a studio on, on your own with very little sort of external validation must be its own kind of, you know, via dolorosa. I don't I think, you know, we shouldn't idealize it too much. 
So I, I'm kind of, I really like you and I envy you at the same time. <laughs> I'm very ambivalent. I think it's, but I, I, and I think there are interesting arguments about, you know, should, should the artist be given, you know, any different treatment to, to normal, poor, forked creatures like us? You know, the, we all have, we all have to live. And what are those choices that you make in order to do that? And the compromises that you make? And should, we, should, should the artist be elevated to some kind of seer or prophet? Or, or should we not expect of them any more than, than we do of, of our economists? I hope, I hope the answer would be that you know, art is there for a very good reason, which is it yields truths that you know, nothing else can. And that's why we all insist on it in one way or another. We all still want it, even in the most repressive societies. Art has a way of, like water, of finding its way out. So I, I, that, if, that's, if that's helpful as a response in terms of the idea of meaning, then, yeah. That's a lovely point. Um, it, does anyone have a final uh, thing to say before we move on to our next question? Okay. Well, that's, I mean, that's actually a very good segue into, into meaning itself. Um, so the, 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 the short question that I've written is, um, you know, what are the meanings of Rubinoff's work? If so, where do they come from? And the reason I have that second question is that really since, since the advent of, um, of postmodernism, scholars are no longer certain about the origins of artistic meaning, indeed meaning in, in general. Uh, you know, t typically they, they presume that the artist created meaning and we then just, you know, received it. Um, and since really at least the 1960s, people, that, that whole idea of, 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 um, of unidirectional meaning has been challenged. And, uh, you know, how many meanings are there? Countless meanings for every different person who sees something. Um, so, uh, but at the same time, Jeffrey seems to be someone who's very, um, intent on on controlling that meaning. He knows what his his work is about. He doesn't want that message to be lost. Um, so, um, how do we uh, negotiate our way through this uh, issue? Do the meanings re reside in the objects only? Are those meanings instead made by the people who visit them, and therefore there being countless different meanings? Um, and um, so, so that's really the question. To, to, to think about how, how we go about this. Um, Jeffrey, do you want to, to say anything about, about meaning? I mean, I, I've encountered, and I'm sure um, Barry has encountered many different artists, and it's, it's funny how different they are in their, in their approach to, to meaning. Some of them say, I don't care what it means. Uh, I just put the, I put the stuff out there, and the people, the audience, can make of it what they want. And others, however, are very, very prescriptive about the content of their work. Barry, do you... But, but is there a distinction to be draw, drawn between meaning and response? So it's one thing to say that this, mean, this work means something, but it's another to say, I respond to it in this way. Well, how, I mean, how far does meaning come from the art historians who later on try to connect it? You know, if you're doing a sort of um, Panofskian interpretation where you'll say it's a sort of Hegelian product of society itself, and that's, no, that's nothing that yes, we that, can do at the, at the moment. I mean, we, we can all, to some extent, just play with the words here. I, I would make a distinction between the context of creation, where we would say the meaning is the meaning that the artists intend, but make a distinction between that and the context of reception, where the meaning may be that that is picked up by the observers or the meaning it has for them. And are we really saying, oh no, that, that's quite wrong. It can't have that meaning for them because the term meaning can only, can only be restricted to the intentions of the artist in the first place. Are we really saying that? Jeffrey, do you, I mean, if someone came along here in 20 years time and said these works are all about, you know, Lego, I've decided it's all about Lego, I, I don't know, that's the first thing I think of. I mean, is that, how do you feel about that? Because... I feel that your book would have failed. <laughs> Chocolate cake. <laughs> No, but it is, it is difficult. I, I do it, take people on, I do take, I've taken hundreds of people uh, on uh, artist to company tours, small knots of people. And uh, I know that it's very difficult for them. For most people, they're not aware of sculpture at all. They've passed it by. They've maybe seen it on a mall. They've seen it maybe in museums. 
but they've always walked by it. And so I try to bring people to the meaning of sculpture to me uh, on those tours and what I see. And I, I have to say that, quite frankly, I'm amazed by people who had no interest in sculpture before, maybe no interest in art before, uh, on how they've responded to these tours. They, there's been a very, very strong connection. So I know that I can do that personally, uh, and, uh, but, uh, and Karun is gonna take over the tours this year, so hopefully he'll be able to communicate that. So it's no possible that we can keep going on in, a, in, a, in an oral history, but you know, you're doing the written history, and like I said, you know, hopefully people will actually read it. And you know, the idea of having the sculpture park here is having this material available, all of our material available to anyone who's actually interested. So anyone who's actually interested can actually sit down with any of the material that we have. And we have it in print. So we not only have it online, but we have, you know, you can see a rack full of print over there. We have these little books we're publishing now. So hopefully we're able to communicate that. And um, uh, I, what this has allowed for in the way that this has gone with so many insights and concepts is that people can grow into it however they want to grow into it, if they want to grow into it. Sorry. Jenny. Um, I know we've talked over the years about post-postmodernism and particular points of critique that you have with Lyotard and others. Um, and if you'll forgive me for introducing um, or sort of bringing the examples of Let's see, Jasper Johns, Rauschenberg, and um, Klaus Oldenburg into the discussion. Um, I keep thinking that there's something um, that you still do allow room for individual experience in, in sort of the, the development of meaning for either the visitor in the future, the artist, the young artist who comes here and maybe over time absorbs your insights and then applies them in, in some way. There's something, I, I think that, that you do have some sort of kinship or at least some sort of allowance for um, the point of, let's see, what is it Jasper John says, um, that the real content lies with the individual. Is, is, is that something? Yeah, I would say that that's pretty true. Yeah. I, I think that in that group, I think it's really unfair you know, I, Rauschenberg took advantage of being a Castelli artist and probably claimed to be a pop artist, but, you know, he really sat on the abstract expressionist side of things. And, you know, it was like another way of selling him, so selling him with Oldenburg. Well, actually, Oldenburg was with uh, Janus, I think, but uh, at the time. But it was a way of selling him with this new wave of meaningless work, you know, and, and putting fast food, fast food art is what I call it, you know, the, the kind of show that you dash into, take it in in five seconds, say, oh boy, I did that, and go down to the next gallery, take in the fast food. And then, you know, you have about as much satisfaction after doing that as you do after eating a McDonald's. So, you know, it's the McDonald's of art. Uh, it was the way America was going to go. It was the way the American art market was going to go. It was, it was perfect. But Rauschenberg crosses a line here. And he, I don't, I, I've never really looked at him as a pop artist. He was an incredible printmaker, for one thing. And, and his printmaking is just absolutely outstanding. So uh, I, I, I don't foreclose things, but what I foreclose is, is the fast food aspect of it. Because I, I think that uh, that's a shame. That's a shame. Art loses something. You know, art loses something as fast food. David, I think, is going to have a go at something. <laughs> Well, again, I'm, uh, you can say that I really skate on thin ice in these uh, discussions, and I keep having to go back to the, the background that I come from. So I um, for me, if you talk about the meaning of something, it starts in the head. So the meaning of whatever you're doing starts, uh, is in your head. And so I try to think, well, are there parallels that I can relate to that? And then the answer is yes, uh, that um, the, the way I think about 
some of the great new ideas that have come out in theoretical physics is that the great theoretical physicists have a model of the world in their head which only they have access to. But they can see connections and insights in that which they can then um, articulate and that emerges, and it is a social construct, by the way, to use postmodern language. I don't believe the end result is a social construct, but the emergence and acceptance of these ideas is a form of social construct because scientists argue like hell about it. Yeah? And then something is, is accepted. So uh, the, the, uh, the meaning, therefore, which is created, the theory, the new theory of whatever that is created, um, sort of emerges for me uh, in this way. And I wonder if there is a tiny um, parallel, actually, with the way that uh, I've, I've thought occasionally about this, that uh, art forms become accepted. So if, if I, we go back to um, Impressionists, um, who clearly uh, it was you know, beyond any pale for most uh, people when they first came on the scene, and yet now we look at them and we can share whatever it was that they had. And so that's become accepted as a, as a great form of, some form of truth and experience uh, for us. Um, so, so I do see um, parallels there, but meaning starts with the individual, and then um, if it has a wider more universal relevance, which we, we can't actually, I don't understand what, what it is, but if it can capture that with people, then it, it establishes it itself as a new form of thinking, way of expression, accepted by others. Yeah. I don't but, know if but, this But may... suppose, suppose... Oh dear, you're suppose, not going to ask me a question, are you? Yeah, I'm going to ask you a question and respond. Suppose uh, the science is commodified so that... Uh, for example, very good examples of which we can do at any point on the forces of, uh, uh, of uh, technology taking over a scientific concept and taking it somewhere where it's nowhere near where the originator thought. Yeah. And, and suppose then, you know, m most of the values of your work and most of the values of scientists are now on its commodity value. Has this been adopted? Is it on the shelf? Can I go and buy it in yeah. a bottle? Yeah. Suppose that was the, the way it was valued. Now, this is my criticism of this particular thing. Commodification, yeah. becomes, commodification becomes the end in itself. Not, yeah. not, not the evolution of knowledge, but rather uh, you've now created a currency in a tradable value, and now you use that tradable value, and that's what establishes whether or not it's good or bad. And that's what started to happen in the 1960s. If you walk into a dealer, you know, I actually had a, a, a dealer say to me, and I won't say who, well, I, run, I should say who at some point or another because he was really a very senior dealer. He's no good, he doesn't sell. You know, and I mean, we're, talking, we're not talking about some small guy here, we're talking about a real influence in the art world. That, that was his opinion of the art of this person is there's no good because it didn't sell. So, so this commodification part of art in the 1960s would be as though the only value to science is whether or not you can put it in a bottle, somebody can take it and say, wow, look at what science did for me today, you know. Well, I'm, I'm completely with you on that. Uh, in that, I mean, I started in this free world of theoretical physics, just trying to understand, understand things for their, for their own right, a form of escapism uh, mm -hmm. for me. Um, but latterly in my career, I did work um, collaboratively with people in industry, I mean, I, uh, in, in this area of parallel computing, God help me, which, which Karun uh, mentioned. I mean, I made a living, a research living about working mm -hmm. with industry people. Um, and I thought that was okay, but we, we didn't, um, how can I say? It um, didn't it was become not the a, only we were set not, of values. We wasn't not, the only set of values. We were not driven by a yeah. purely utilitarian yes. thing. Right. The, the work itself had to be, had to have a, a, a curiosity sure. uh, as well yes. about it. But there is um, a fulfillment to be gained as well by doing something that people find useful. A absolutely. I've been part of capitalism myself and I've been trans trying to translate it now into the, the values that I have now. So I, I don't disagree, but what happened in art is, is that the commodification of, uh, of it in the 1960s became the only measure of its value in all of the magazines and in all of the support system. So just, I mean, this is, uh, the pressure on this is uh, still very real. I mean, in the UK, um, there, there has been an agenda um, of impact. 
of um, the, uh, for uh, research. Fortunately, for historians uh, uh, like James, your impact is if you're on television and you reach millions. He's made, actually. Isn't he? <laughs> but impact is a part of our culture nowadays. And for me, uh, and this is impact, it's economic and social. I don't mm -hmm. mind the word of Inca impact, but I want it to be intellectual as well. Mm -hmm. That's fine. Mark, I think, has something to say. I had a quick question, Geoffrey, about how much you've actively, since you moved here in the 70s, how much you've act actively sought uh, objective responses to your work to, as a way for you to negotiate the meanings of your work. I mean, did you ever think of, in a way, I guess the forum is, is a mode of that, but when you came here in the 70s, did you think about bringing reviewers out or encouraging reviewers to come or other artists to come and responding that you could then engage in a dialogue with them about your work or there was a more objective dialogue about your work out there? There's something about sort of isolating. Yeah. After the commodification is about the, you know, it's in its totality by the mid 60s and certainly evident in the early 70s, uh, I looked at it as, as, as really hopeless. I, told it, I, I actually talked about that reviewer who actually was here the Princeton art historian who had turned to Reiki rather than doing reviews anymore because he saw that it's so corrupt. So, uh, no, in the 70s, I, I looked at the art world as really hopeless. Uh, in the 80s, I had hoped it had turned, and that's when I started going back to New York, as I ho hoped it had made a turn. You know, it, what's so interesting about this is, is that so many things are cyclical in markets so that they move from one area to another, you know, that, that they would return to a set of values that I could identify with. And what I found in the 90s, even in the 90s and the 80s and the 90s is no, the, the market thing had established itself, the commodification had so established itself that it seemed like uh, there was a lock on it because all of the real estate in New York that was being leased is now seen as retail space for art. And it was like, mm, there's no way into that particular thing for somebody like me. Neither in the values that I have or in the work that I do. So finally I just abandoned New York by 1998. Well, not quite, I did one more show in 2000. But. I, th I think we have two more um, people want to speak. I think Maria and Heather after Maria. Uh, just a very quick comment uh, uh, to Rod and Mark's question. And that is, of course, Jack Shadbolt, who um, was the leading artist in British Columbia, lived on Hornby. Uh, well, didn't I mean, he had a summer cottage on Hornby and greatly helped Vaughn in his work. Um, did he come and look at your work? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So there we was. We had a very interesting somewhere. conversation. We yeah. Had a very and I knew Jack. And he was very ubilient. And, yeah. We yeah. had a very interesting conversation the day that. Now, did he contribute as a as a viewer? Did he contribute anything to your? No, we were running counter at that point. He was running on the idea that art was anywhere and anything. And I was arguing uh, that, no, there was a, a history of art where there were things that were passed down from artist to artist. And I, he said, out of nowhere, define art. And I dropped my definition on him and his mouth dropped. <laughs> and he, he thought for a Jack, little while. He thought a for a little leader. while, and he said, "You know, big art encourages big ideas." And that was that was his last comment on, but, on the but place. But we know Jack was not a deep thinker. So, uh, <laughs> but but there is a dive. There was a dive. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Heather, would you like to speak? I, I just was wondering if Jeff wanted. I was just wondering if you wanted to say anything about the impact of working to music on your sculpture because the beginning forms we talked a lot about counterpoint and you still the park hosts the music so we're able to listen to the quartets amongst the sculptures and that's a, it, it's a different type of meaning it's certainly an experience in the early years box b minor mass would when i was uh, in the in the process of in the very initial time of trying to bring the art together in its design stage was on endlessly. I would just play it endlessly. Uh, so there were different different musics that went with different parts, but 
the Bach definitely, the Bach B minor mass was definitely one of those pieces that just played uh, on a, I didn't have a tape, so I just would put it on the turntable and just just play it endlessly. So here, here yeah, in the little farmhouse over here, yeah. Uh, later on now when I'm working, uh, uh, I have Schoenberg on. So, and Schoenberg works for me in, in the pieces that I'm working on now. So. He, he, and I just stay to one musician at that particular point until the piece starts to come together one way or the other. Um, although I'll often start with Bach again too, so I didn't finish with Schoenberg, so. Yeah, they, these do have, they're there because it, it somehow or another adjusts my mind to the counterpoint that I'm trying to find. I don't know if this, this is on. I, I often found that when you take people around on tour, you don't so much tell them what the meaning of the sculpture is. I don't. You don't do that. You tell them your your uh, your thoughts as they arose as you were doing them. Mm. Your history. You give them your context, and and they, there's lots of hints that you're. You know, at the meanings mm. to you. I mean, if you took the time to read, mm -hmm. you would definitely get the, you know, but you never really say, this is what my sculpture means to no. me, and it should mean this to you too. Yeah. Um, and I think it's, I, I've, I've noticed at times that you actually almost encourage people to come back and, and you know, you change, as you, I've heard you say that, you know, as, the, as you change and mature and, and have your own history, you come to it and get new things in it. And you really you value art greatly that can, that can actually uh, grow with you, and you can grow with it. And that you know new new insights and new uh, meanings are generated as you grow with it. Um, I wonder if you could just well, I, I think yeah, I agree. I, I realize that when I take people around, and since most people know nothing about sculpture, uh, that that's a complexity all on its own, and so. I, I try to like introduce it to them in a way that doesn't bury them. So the idea is is that if they want to find any more meaning from the writings or any of those other things, they can voluntarily do it. But I found people, you know, on, during our openings, total strangers sitting down, lost in papers, you know, uh, sitting down and, and reading and concentrating on papers. So we've left a path for anyone to grow with this if they want to grow with it, but I certainly don't try to dictate that. I don't think it just is pointless because uh, then they get lost on even seeing the fundamentals of the value of sculpture. Right? This is what's so, so nice about the, uh, the book so far is that uh, we've, we've had four, four chapters completed and each of them has, has found completely different things. Uh, in the work, and I think you know, I'm, I'm hoping that you know, as we move up to 12, 13, 14 chapters, that we'll have 12, 13, 14 completely different approaches, um, and it's that diversity that that makes the work is 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 a testament to the strength of the work and the complexity and richness of it. Um, does anyone have anything else? To, I know that. Okay, Karun does the timeout gesture to me, which means which is the international symbol for coffee. Um, mm -hmm. So, um, so let's, let's end this discussion here and have a 15, 20 minute break. Mm -hmm. Thank you.